Welcome to our A to J Author 2017 training series. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Author Program Manager for the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction. This training series covers how A to J Author and Hot Docs work together, an overview of A to J Author and basic question design, macros and functions, and repeat loops, advanced logic, and tips and tricks from experienced authors. This is video three. We'll cover macros and functions. The agenda today is broken up into two parts. The first part of this video will, be, will cover variable macros, what they are, the format, where you can use them, and how you can customize your A to J guided interviews with them. The second part will cover functions, what functions are, where you can use them, specifically the age, date, today, has answered, contains, ordinal, and sum functions. And then we'll talk a little bit about syntax reminders and additional resources when dealing with functions. So first up is variable macros. What is a variable macro? A variable macro is a way to call up the value of a variable in question text, learn more prompts, learn more answers, field labels, radio buttons, and signposts. It's a great way for you as an author to customize your interview based on information that the end user has already given you. The format for using a variable macro within A to J author is double percent sign, bracket, the name of the variable, close bracket, double percent sign. You can see here in this screenshot that I'm using it in the text section to call out the client's first name. If we look back at this screenshot, this is what it would look like to the end user. You can use variable macros in several places within your guided interview. You can use it in the question text. You can use it in a learn more prompt, which is new in A to J Author 6. You can use it in the learn more help. The prompt is what the end user avatar thinks. The help is the answer that the guide avatar gives if the end user clicks the little learn more button. You can also use it in radio buttons, field labels, and signposts. This is an example of it in question text, which we've already seen. This is an example in a learn more prompt where the end user is thinking the question, why would I want whoever the name they gave as their primary agent to be my, child, my children's guardian too? You can learn, use it in learn more help, so you can call up the information they've given you to help personalize the guide avatar's response to the end user's question. You can use it in radio buttons to call out answers they've already given. So for example, this question asks, which of these people would you like to be made your primary agent? The two questions before it said, who would you like to be the first agent and who would you like to be the second agent? So instead, in this third question of just saying, who do you want to be the primary, either agent one or agent two, give the end user the names they've already given you and making it easier for them to remember who they put as agent one and agent two. You can use it in field labels. So a field label is what is displayed to the end user above a field to help them uh, further clarify what information is expected of them when they're typing in an answer. You can use it also in step signposts. So here the step is set. There's logic before this question is shown, before the question on the step is shown that sets A to J step to hello plus a space plus the client's first name. Variable macros are a great way to customize your interview, but it's um, more than just inserting the end user's name into an interview. So for example, in a repeat loop that asks for personal information, you can collect the name first and then move on to follow-ups like what is Jane's birth date? Who is Jane's father? What is Jane's address? If the end user is entering multiple people, it would help them to remember who they're talking about and which person they're on in this loop. You can also display information collected in the loop to an end user. So for example, if you are asking the end user f to list all of their assets over $100, you could have a learn more on the question that says, do you have any more assets? That tells the end user what assets they've already told you about. So you've told me about your house, car, jet ski, um, bank accounts, and it would keep adding the more the end user gives you information in a loop, it would continue to add on to that list. So the end user essentially has an ongoing list for them to refer back to. 
You can use interview uh, macros also as a way, instead of using words like child slash children asset with the S in parentheses, is slash R, you as the author can figure out what the correct word it to be used is. So if they have one child, the correct word then to use later in the interview is child. If they have multiple children, then the correct word would be children. So instead of saying, do your child or does your child slash children have the same father? You can either say, uh, um, you could either use child or you can use children correctly. The next section we're going to talk about is functions. Functions are built in actions performed to alter data collected. The format for using a function is to use whatever function it is, like age, sum, dollar, etc., all in caps, and then you wrap your variable name in brackets and parentheses. There are two places in A to J Author that you can use functions. The first and most common is in the logic section. For example, in the logic statement on the screen here, I'm testing whether the date of birth they've given me, converted to an age, converted to a number, is less than 18. If it's less than 18, the end user is taken to a screen that explains that they have to be over 18 to use this interview and they don't qualify. Otherwise, else, if they're over 18, they're taken on to the next set of questions. This saves your end user who is successful, the one who is supposed to use the form that's over 18, from having to enter their date of birth and also having to say whether they are over 18 or not. So it saves the successful end user uh, an additional question and it allows you as the author to use information they've already given you and use a function built into the author to test a condition. The other place to use functions is within the question text itself. The example here, um, I am telling my end user a specific date in which they have to file their response with the court. That date is the notice date they've given me plus 30 days. So instead of just saying you have to file a response with the court 30 days after your notice date, I can actually give them whatever that 30 days after the notice date is by using the function date. So in this example, I'm using a macro to call out the whatever value is held by notice date plus 30 days and convert that to a date. So instead of it saying you have to file by 30 days, it says you have to file by 8-31-2017. The first function to talk about is age. So you've already seen this in the first screenshot of this section, but this is converting a date to an age in years, which I can then use later to test as a condition. The syntax for it is age, all in caps, parentheses, brackets around my variable, close brackets, close parentheses. The second function we're going to talk about is date. It converts days into the month, month, day, day, year, 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 year format. The syntax is the word date, parentheses, brackets around the variable name, and in this example I'm adding 30 days to that date and then closing the parentheses. So you could do math within the function itself. Another one is today, so it returns today's date. So it can be used, for example, to determine if a user was within a statute of limitations. So you would use today minus whatever variable date. So for example, in my screenshot, the incident date, testing whether today minus the incident date is greater than 90 days. If it's greater than 90 days, they've passed the statute of limitations and they go on to a question that says, sorry, you don't qualify. Today is also a special function in that it can, it can be used in the calendar, in a field with a calendar, um, and you can set it as a minimum or a maximum um, restriction on that date field. So if you set today, all in caps, as the minimum, the end user won't be able to enter a date in the past. If you set today as the maximum, they won't be able to enter a date in the future. Has answered is another commonly used function. It returns a true false value if a variable has that value. So it tells you whether whatever variable you put in the brackets within the parentheses is answered or not. 
This is commonly used when trying to, to um, determine if an end user has answered a middle name in order to create a full name variable. So in the screenshot here in the logic, it says if has answered middle name, TE, set full name to first name, space, middle name, space, last name, else or otherwise if they haven't answered middle name, set full name to just first space, last name. If you didn't set this condition, and you just set client full name to first space middle space last, you would have an extra space in there and it would look a little bit off um, on your full name because middle name was missing. So this is a, just a way to have a clean um, answer within client full name TE. But you can use has answered in other situations as well. It returns a true false value if the variable uh, holds a value or not. Contains is a new function in A to J6. It evaluates if a variable contains a text string. So for example, you as the author want to identify people who say they have issues related to domestic violence when they're asking a generic what's your legal problem question. So you can set up the contains function in logic to say contains parentheses bracket variable name comma whatever value you're looking for in, in quotes, close parentheses. So in this screenshot, if contains, so if legal problem TE contains the word violence, I want to send them on to a follow-up question that says something like, you may have an issue with violence in your household, please tell me more about that. You as the author can put any word in that text string or any um, uh, any phrase in the text string and A to J will search for whether that phrase or word is within the variable um, that you put next to it in the contains function. So this was uh, requested from our friends in Canada because they wanted to be able to search if a certain postal code range was within uh, a zip code variable and so um, it can be used for that, it can be used for an example here for a longer paragraph text where you're looking for one word you could have it multiple times, so if you wanted to look for violence, uh, hit, hurt, pain, something like that, you can have different contains function scripts written around that as well. Ordinal returns the ordinal form of a number, usually used with a repeat loops counting variable. So for example, what is your first asset? What is the name of your first child? What is the name of your fifth child? What is your 75th asset? So it's going to return whatever uh, number variable you put in the parentheses as the ordinal form of it. Um, you can notice here the syntax is ordinal parentheses child count close parentheses. I don't have uh, brackets around my variable. That's because my variable here does not have a space. If I had a number variable that had a space in it, I would need brackets around that variable inside the parentheses. Sum is another uh, one that's commonly used with repeating variables. For example, you ask your end user in a repeat loop, what is, your, uh, what is a monthly expense? How much is it per month? Um, and they go through the loop several times and at the end you want to figure out what their total monthly expenses are. So you use the syntax set uh, client total expense value N NU over here in the screenshot of the logic to the sum of everything held in the repeating variable client expense value NU. We'll learn about repeating variables a little bit more uh, in video four of this training series, but repeating variables, when you tell A to J that they are a repeating variable, that they're set to hold multiple values, it essentially creates an index within that variable, and what sum will do is it will add up all of the values held within that variable. So if they tell you their housing is 1,000, their electric is 50, their water is 50, and uh, their car payment is 200, it'll add all that up to get your monthly expenses. Then you can use that client total expense value and you that, that summed up value to do a confirmation screen. So the total of your monthly expenses is 1600, is this correct? And then yes or no, and they can go back and edit later um, if they've forgotten something. Some syntax reminders and additional resources for functions. The function names like dollar, ordinal, sum, all have to be applied to the variable with parentheses. 
And if your variable name has a space in it, that variable name must be wrapped in brackets inside the parentheses. You can also use functions within macros. So for example, if I wanted to call out whatever value was held by client total asset NU and convert it to a dollar using a uh, format it using the dollar function, which adds um, two decimal places after the period. Um, I can wrap my function in a macro and call out the formatted value. A list of all the functions supported by Ada J Author can be found in our authoring guide, which is at adajauthor.org slash content slash functions. Thank you for watching video three of this series. The next video in this series can be found at youtube.com slash adajauthor. As always, if you have questions, feel free to email me, jessica at cali.org. Thank you.